So before I before I start my talk, I would also like to thank the organizers for uh, the great conference. I apologize for not being here at the start of the week, but uh, it's also the start of our semester in, in Australia, so it's a little bit complicated to be here. But it's really great to be here and see so many because of my friends and collaborators and everyone else here. So, uh, and yes, today I'm going to talk about some joint work with Seamus Albion, and you may have seen his poster yesterday, and Eric Graves, and, and essentially the question that I'm talking about is, well, can we generalize the elliptic Salvark integral, and I'll explain what that is, and the an Salvark integral, so that's something different, and I'll also explain what that is, and put that all together, and get something that we can call an an elliptic Salvark integral. So unfortunately, given the, the topic, it's, it's somewhat technical, and I'll try to sort of not go into the technicalities too much, and occasionally you'll see big formulas, and again, I, my hope is that you won't try to zoom in into the details, but just get the structure of what really is going on. So anyway, let's see if I succeed in that. And so, well, Selberg, so I should really start there, so this goes back a, a long way in the 1940s, when Selberg wrote down his now famous hypergeometric integral. So hopefully most of you here have seen this integral before. If you haven't, I mean, it's a fantastic integral. It's not just a beautiful formula, but it's incredibly important in almost any branch of mathematics or mathematical physics. So this thing shows up all over the place. So it really deserves our attention. And of course, this is a generalization, so a k-fold generalization of the order beta integral. Okay, so, so what you see is, on the left-hand side in the integrand, I guess the most important thing is that you see roughly a random determinant raised to some power. This is an arbitrary complex power, because gamma is just complex, which is nice to write that power is two times gamma. Um, and then you have some other factors, and then you integrate over that, and on the right hand side, you have a beautiful expression in terms of just the normal gamma functions. Okay, so that's Salberg's integral. Um, Salberg himself initially didn't think too much about, about this. I mean, in 1941, he published this in a slightly different form, thinking that it would already be known. And then when he realized it wasn't, he, he published it in this particular form, but it was in some high school journal. So we were thinking that this was mostly of interest to high school teachers and not really to professional mathematicians, but of course he was wrong. All right, so that's the actual cell work integral. And we're going slightly beyond that in this talk. So you can sort of bump up this integral a little bit. So maybe I should have said that the, the integrand of the cell work integral I'll often not sure if you can see that, I just, it's a little bit dark on the screen. The entire integrand of the Selberg integral, I just call that the Selberg density, I just call that delta of t, and it depends on these parameters, alpha, beta, and gamma. And so, essentially what this integral, Cadell's integral is about, you take exactly the Selberg integral, but you put in a jack polynomial, so that's one of these classical families of symmetric functions, you put it in there, and it turns out that you can still evaluate this in closed form. I haven't given you the evaluation because it's just another nice product of gamma functions and the details are not that important. But the point is you can still do this. Um, well, why is that perhaps important? Well, let, let me talk about that a little bit later. Let's just for now note that there's this generalization, which of course came much, much later than Selberg's original integral. It's still very noisy. About 50 years later, um, Cadell also observed that you can put two jack polynomials in the integrand, so indexed by different partitions, but then one of these parameters, the beta parameter, has to be equal to the gamma parameter. So there's a restriction. So provided you have a restriction, you can put in two jack polynomials, and in the case of sure, so that's when gamma is equal to 1, 
Um, this was already done previously by Gua, and so this is usually known as the Gua Cadell integral. Again, more recent, and this is really where it becomes interesting, uh, a whole bunch of authors realized that it's not necessary to set this beta equal to gamma, but what happens that in one of these, the second Jack polynomial, you have to shift the argument in a platistic way. Now, if you're familiar with platistic notation in the theory of symmetric functions, then that's fine. I have little time to explain what this is. So rather than the usual notation of symmetric function, you use some additive notation. And then, as you can see, in the second here sort of alphabet, there's this, this weird shift going on. So this is some platistic substitution. And hopefully you can see beta is equal to gamma. Then you get a 1 minus 1 within the statistic brackets that just vanishes, and you get back to Wachadel integral. So this is the most general form, really, of sort of Selberg type integrals. And again, this evaluates in closed form just with the product of gamma functions, which I haven't written down because what? the exact form is not that important. And so why is this really, really nice? Well, so in fact, I've tried here to explain what this statistic notation is when you do this on the power sums. So the power sum basis, of course, it's an algebraic base in the ring of symmetric functions. And so essentially it means that if you plus some complex number z on the standard set of alphabet, you just take the power sum and you replace it by that same power sum, but now with a z, and now by just linearity, this you know what to do for any symmetric function. In any case, let's not worry about that too much. The important point is that this most general form of the Selberg integral, or this AFLT integral, is really important because it can actually be used, for example, if you're interested in this AGT business, and certainly a lot of people seem to be, that if you look at AGT for SU2, then precisely that particular integral, for example, can help you to deal with that particular case. So, this is just one example of a sort of pretty important implication or application of this Selberg type integral. So it's really, really nice. And you need that most general form with these two jack polynomials and one of them consistently substituted. For some magic reasons, this allows you to do stuff related to this AGT projection. All right, so that's the Selberg world. Everything here is classical. There's no elliptic functions yet. But as probably many of you know, well, okay, I'm not going there yet. So maybe a slightly, sort of a slight detour. So how you can think of these Selberg type integrals. So I guess this is known to hopefully everyone here, that if I just take the classical sort of the hypergeometric differential <laughs> equation studied by Gauss and also by Euler, that it has, well, I guess Gauss studied the series solutions and Euler wrote down an integral solution to the happy geometric differential equation. And, and there it is. And you can see if I set x, if I make a special choice for the variable x, so this of course is a differential equation in x, either at 0 or at 1, then I basically get the uh, Euler beta integral, and so this integral can be evaluated in closed form. So what about the Selberg integral? Because the Euler beta integral, well, that's just the, as I said, the one variable case of Selberg. So it's some differential equation link with Selberg. And of course, that's the case. So now the correct sort of language, if you want to do this for the multivariate case, it's really the, so I guess, the, the world of KZ equations. And if you just take the KZ equation with uh, just two complex parameters, z and w. Of course, you can do this for more, but that's enough for us here. So now this is just some um, differential equation. And we're looking at solutions um, that live in the space. So essentially, I take two representations. And here, we're, we're considering just SL2. 
Um, so these are two representations indexed by two highest weights, lambda and mu. So these are not partitions like I had them earlier as indices of the jet polynomial. So these are actual weights. Um, and I look at solutions. So in this tensor product space, so of course that decomposes into irreducibles again. And then I look at exactly those irreducible factors of a particular a given weight. They're all of the form, you just take the sum of the weights and then you subtract a multiple of the, well, there's only a, si a single simple root because we're doing SL2 here. And you look in this particular space, and again, you can write down solutions in terms of cellular time integrals. This works way more generally, not just SL2. You can do this for any simple Lie algebra, uh, as was done by Schechtman and Wojcicki. Um, and again, at special points, just like in the Euler case when you said x is equal to 0 or 1 here, if you take special points, z and w, because now of course we have partial differential equations, I set them two variables. If you look at these special points, you just get these solutions just become the Selbach integral. So this is a, a way you get the Selbach integral from a sort of differential equation type things. Well, so now it's clear what we should do. Rather than SL2, what happens if we look at SLM? or SLM plus 1, because I think in my title I had AN, so I should make sure that the indices match. Um, so again, as I said, they have general solutions in terms of cellular type integrals. So if we take the AN case, and again we look at special points, can we explicitly evaluate these integrals? So is that going to happen or not? Of course the answer is yes. So again, so that's sort of what's the case. So first of all, what I now need to do, so here sort of we need to talk a little bit about the structure of these integrals that show up. So previously we had a single integer variable k that gave us the number of variables in our cell work integral. So now what's going to happen, if we look this, so here's the A and Dinkin diagram. So now you look at all of the vertices of the Dinkin diagram, and to each vertex you attach a set of integration variables. Right? So previously we just had a single node that was SL2, so we had one set of integration variables. Now we have n sets of integration variables, so I'll call them T1 up to Tn. And so these sets, right, they each have their own cardinality, so the i vertex has a the cardinality of that set of integration variables will be ki. And I need to impose a particular ordering. So you can see that if I go from left to right, the number of integration variables must weakly increase. And I'll explain in a moment why this is the case. Okay, it's not clear a priori that that's what you have to do, but that is the case. So as before, we need just the Vandermond determinant. So variables within so if I take at one look at one set of variables that live on the same ver the node of the Dinkin diagram, they're coupled again by a Vandermond determinant raised to some power, which again we're going to call two times gamma. But I also want something that represents the edges. Otherwise, I just get a product of Selbach integrals. So for two neighboring sets of integration variables, I have a Again, it looks a little bit like a Vandermond determinant, but now it couples different neighboring sets of variables. So only if they're neighbors on the Dinkin diagram. So that represents the edges of the Dinkin diagram. Okay, so that's things we need. And then here is, so this looks very complicated now, but hopefully, you see on the left hand side, we essentially have a product now of these van der Monde determinants, and maybe I should really try to use a pointer, or I can also use a, a pointer, I guess, on the, or maybe I should use the actual pointer here, if that works. Right. Yeah, I'll use this one here. So here's the van der Monde determinant, and that's for each of the n different alphabets. That's just the standard van der Monde, raised to the power of 2 gamma, and now you have n minus 1 edges in the Dinkin diagram, and so you can see these are neighboring alphabets. There's now this Vandermont type. 
sort of edge connection. And you see now the power is minus gamma. So this 2 and this minus 1, of course, they're precisely, right? That's on the integer. So these are just the entries of the Cartan matrix. So if you were to go to other types, then you would know what, what their correct exponents are. And then you have some, some, some individual variables that don't couple to anything else, raised to the power alpha, and 1 minus ti for each of the alphabets raised to the power, and some betas there. And what exactly the right inside is, is not that important, but you can see, again, it's a product of gamma functions. Right? So it's much more complicated than the Selbert integral, but if you take n is equal to 1, this is just the Selbert integral. So this is the an Selbert integral. But you need to impose some additional conditions. So these alphas can be anything you like, complex numbers, but all of these betas have to be equal to 1 except for the last beta. So if I go back to my Dinkin diagram, and again, I'll explain in a moment why this is. So, so there is an alpha attached to this one, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, up to alpha n, that the betas here are all 1s except for this last one. There's a single beta and there's n different alphas. And then we have this funny ordering of the cardinalities as well. But assuming that that's all the case, this thing evaluates whether well, some complicated integration chain that I won't trouble you with. Um, and so in the case of SO3, Tarasov and Farchenko did this in 2003, wrote down this integral, and then a few years later I did the full AN case. And so that's what it is. Okay. So that's the AN version of the Salvar integral. All right, so what's going on here? Um, well, before I explain what's going on, again, a remark that you can bump this up and put in some jack polynomials if you want. And now there's, again, two jack polynomials. You can put one on the first vertex and one on the last vertex. Of course, in the Selberg case, there's only one vertex, so they would both live in the same vertex. That's the AFLT integral. And again, you can see that this one is statistically uh, shifted here, and this is just a normal jack polynomial. All right, so why do we have, oh, and I wrote a zero here, and this should have been a one, of course, not a zero. Well, I think I can correct that. Let's do, oops, where's my pen? That's, there we go, that's one. Well, because in that particular, I, I told you we were looking at these sort of tensor products, and now we look at the decomposition, and we were, now we sit in this, we, we consider this particular space. So again, this would be the sum of these weights. So any of the weights occurring in the tensor product decomposition of something like this would be this, the sum of the weights, and then you just subtract multiples of the simple roots so all these ki's must be positive. But if you want a, a, a decomposition such that all of the multiplicities are 1, then that precise, so in other words, if you want that, so let's put in a 1 here in advance. We say that's what we want. We want multiplicity 1 because there's some conjecture by moving them for Chenko that that's what you should consider. Then you should get these nice evaluations. So we need to tune these weights in such a way that we can never get multiplicities greater than 1. Here. And that turns out, well, then over here you can take, this is an arbitrary weight. For now, of course, if I really want this to be integral, then these alpha i's are, should be integers greater than 1. And then later we just analytically continue this to arbitrary complex alphas and betas as we can do in the integral. But from the representation theory point of view, that's what we need. But it's a bit unfortunate. These alpha i's are the exponents of the Salvic integral. These alpha i's here, they are the simple roots. So uh, maybe I should have used the bar for, for one of them. Yes, Eric? Yeah, uh, similarly, I think you're the lambda and u on the bottom of the slide are not the lambda and u the McDonald's model. No, no, again, you're absolutely right. Yeah, 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 you're absolutely right. So uh, that's pretty terrible. Forget about the, the, this lambda, this mu. These, of course, are indeed 
partitions, indexing, and everything over here we're dealing with weights. And so, yeah, yeah, no, that's very confusing. So I apologize for my terrible choice of notation. There's just, yeah, I mean, it's in, in Selmec, we're so used to writing alphas for these exponents. And of course, simple roots, they're also alphas. And there aren't enough Greek letters. There are not enough Greek letters, indeed. <laughs> in any case, so for now, this is an arbitrary weight. But here, we can't take an arbitrary weight. So essentially, we want, we need all of these omega i, so these are of course the fundamental weights, we need these all to be zero except for the last one, so we're really taking the tensor product with omega r, and you can take an r or a multiple of that, because beta r can be anything. Then, indeed, you will always get a one, and it turns out that this decomposition then, it says, well, which ki's can occur here? Well, it just so happens that these ki's are then ordered in this way. That's just the tensor product decomposition that you'll get. And so that's the space we live in, and that explains these restrictions in the internet. Okay, so, all right. So in any case, so that's of course, I mean, there's no proof that if you consider more general values that you can't get an integral evaluation. No one has found one. And as I said, the conjecture is that you will never be able to find it. So probably not a great exercise trying to do this. But in any case, here we are fine, and, and this is the idea. Okay, so that's the an Salberg integral, so nothing elliptic. So now we go back to SL2. And, well, hopefully many of you have seen this before. It, it's on the conference poster. It's even on the conference poster, so everyone has seen this before, but maybe not everyone appreciates how beautiful this is. So, so this is what is known as the elliptic Selbeck integral, and again, it's very confusing. This gamma here is no longer the same gamma as I had on the previous page. This is now the elliptic gamma function, but of course, we still just write that as a gamma, because everything is elliptic, so it's just assumed that that is clear. And so this is now the elliptic gamma function. And structurally, this integral, it has many more parameters. Previously, we had an alpha, a beta, and a gamma. Now we have, well, a t1 up to a t6. And there's a t here. So quite a few more parameters, although they're restricted. So there's some balancing condition going on. But nonetheless, there's more parameters than before. So now we have a p. That's this elliptic p. And there's also a Q, this thing is symmetric in P and Q. And this is roughly what replaces the Vandermond raised to the power 2 gamma. So what is your gamma? Well, you replace this T by some Q to the power gamma, and they let Q go to 0, whatever. Well, first you need to send P to 0, otherwise. Uh, and then you can take these kind of limits, and then you get the gamma from the Selvig integral. So this is the elliptic Selvig integral. And, and this is indeed a perfect PQ analog of the original Selberg integral. So for K is 1, this is, well, I guess the elliptic analog of Ordnance data integral. So that was first done by Slava. It's already more than 20 years ago. That is a bit depressing, but it's true. And then uh, Slava together with uh, Van Dien, First conjectured the full integral, so the case k greater than 1, uh, which was then first proved by Eric in his famous paper. And later, Slava himself found a, what I think you call an elementary proof of this. And, and afterwards, there have, been, there have been more proofs, unfortunately. Of course, Masatoshi san is not here today. But, uh, so now we have quite a few approaches to this. And so, I should say, Eric has a paper where he rigorously showed that you can take a limit of this elliptic Selberg integral and you get the actual Selberg integral. So it really is a, a, a true elliptic analog. All right, so, well, some obvious questions. First of all, what, right, in the Selberg case, we could put in jack polynomials, so we should be able to put in some symmetric functions here. What are they? So what plays the role of these uh, jack polynomials, and then of course, well, this is SO2, we should again pump this up to SLN or SLN plus 1, so the AN phase. 
how to do that. Okay, so that's what I'll try to explain. So that's sort of the generalized elliptic Salvec integrals. So first of all, what plays the role of the Jack polynomials? And that, well, half of that question is already, already answered in, in Eric's annals paper, because he certainly has more than just the elliptic Salvec integral. But, and so indeed, I mean, I called here the range of Gustafsson, uh, Koskun Gustafsson BCN symmetric elliptic interpolation functions. It's a mouthful. So there is a class of functions. So everything in this elliptic Salvec integral, so maybe I should have emphasized that, because we started with things that were type A, but this elliptic Salvec integral, I didn't really explain this plus minus notation. So this really means there's four of these elliptic gamma functions. Zi times Zj, Zi divided by Zj, Zi, or Zj divided by Zi, and then 1 over Zi, Zj. And so this thing really has full hyperoctahedral symmetry. And the same over here. If you replace, it's symmetric in the Zi's, but if you take any of the Zi's and you replace it by 1 over Zi, this thing is symmetric. So in the elliptic world, we are sort of doing BCN, and somehow this limit that Error to rigorously, you get rid of the BCN symmetry and you only are left with just the essentially takes you down to GLN or SLN, whatever. Okay, so, okay, so that's after that remark. So it's not surprising that again, we don't, we shouldn't be putting just symmetric functions in there, we're putting some BCN symmetric functions in there and they have to be elliptic. So in any case, they, they exist, and, and they're generalizations of, of Okunkov's BCN symmetric McDonald's interpolation functions, also a mouthful. And uh, for those who were at the poster session yesterday, uh, you would have seen them on, in some of the posters. Okay, so, so what do these functions roughly look like? Well, so they're functions of K variables, they're indexed by not partitions but by partitions, so a pair of partitions. They depend on, well, except for P, Q, and a T, they also depend on two other parameters, A and B. And so they're elliptic, and, and they have these nice vanishing conditions, just like if you're familiar with Okunkov's <coughs> inter interpolation, McDonald like polynomials, whether it's of type A or, or type B, C they have these vanishing conditions. And here it's the same. So these functions, for example, they vanish at these interpolation points. So you set all of these xi's to a, t to some power, then p to some... So you take another bipartition, so you take, take p to... or xi, you then take p to the power of lambda i with your first bipartition, and q, you, take, you pick your second bipartition, and you do this for all of the variables, then uh, you get vanishing of these functions. It doesn't completely fix them, but it sort of, at least in the spirit of Okunkov, this is roughly what fixes these, determines these functions. Okay? So, and, and it, so we just write this, so this is true for bipartitions such that mu is not contained in lambda. So this is, containment of bipartition just means that the first one is contained in the, so this is two partitions, this is two partitions. The first mu is contained in the first lambda, the second mu is contained in the second lambda. Just the usual. So we have all of these interpolation points. Okay, so that's these elliptic interpolation functions. So really nice class of functions. And they can be viewed as your analogs of the Jack polynomials, if you wish, in a, in a quite a drastic limit. But all right. But what should be the platistically substituted Jack polynomial? Because that's a little bit more difficult because we're now in the BCN world and you can no longer do platistic substitutions. So for those who know about platistic substitutions, it should be clear this works in the symmetric function world. But it's more complicated in the BCN symmetric function world. Well, this is again due to Eric who introduced a skew versions of his interpolation functions. And we just need a special type of this. So essentially we now again have a function like that, but rather than just the AB, it 
contains another pair of variables that are called v and w. And I've just given them exactly the same notation otherwise, so r star, again by partitions here. And these can be, it can be reasoned that these correspond to platistically in the correct limit, give you a platistically substituted jet polynomial. And I've described it here. I mean, this is, this is too horrific to look at. But in any case, there is some claim that if you tend p to 0 and q to 1 and you make some substitutions, you precisely get a platistically substituted jet polynomial. It starts with a bipartition, you lose your first partition in this bipartition, only the second one remains, and you see you get a 1 over gamma here, this is precisely the jet. Details are not important, but now we have all of the functions that we need, and, and so that answers, I guess, that first question, and you can put this in the elliptic Selberg integral. So that's what I've done here. This is still the elliptic Selberg integral as before. And we put, this is a, a, a normal inter, a elliptic interpolation function, so it only contains two parameters, and it's t1 and t2. Remember, there were six of these ti's in the, cell, in the elliptic Selberg integral. We need two of them here. And this is the one that has four parameters. This is the platistically substituted one, so it looks a little bit messier. Again, the details are not so important. But the point is, and I've not given you the evaluation, but this is just, again, a product of the kind, whatever it is. So this is really an analog of this AFLT integral that was used to in, 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 uh, in this AGT business for SU2. So here we have an elliptic analog of that. Okay, but of course, that's not where we should stop. We should really go to the, and so I, I say in the classical limit, right, this you get the AFLT integral. And it also gives you, in some other limit, gives you a, a sort of new integral on McDonald polynomials, if you know what they are. But maybe I shouldn't. Uh, let's just skip this for now. Okay? So, got some nice limits of this, this integral. But this is really the result I would like to. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. This when you wrote infinite product? Oh well, I mean, where did I write infinite product? Yes, I mean, to me, infinite. So this, right? You get some elliptic gamma functions. Elliptic gamma functions are infinite. Q gamma functions. Oh well, I've taken the limit here. In this one, is you're right. In this, in, yeah, absolutely right. So maybe in, in this this case, here I actually even say product of elliptic gamma functions. Here you just get some Pohammer. No, a finite product of Pohammers, yes, but these Pohammers are infinite, yeah. right? Yes. So, um, so it's a Q series, right? Rather than some rational function. Yes. Okay, so this is, I guess, the, the bigger theorem that we now have a, an AN version of this. And so, so this. Structurally, it's quite similar to the N. Selberg integral, well, because this is an elliptic analog. So, we have two elements that sort of make up this. Yes. In the McDonald polynomial case, just before, is yeah. the formal limit k going to infinity possible? The limit k goes to infinity. Yeah. Um, I'm not really sure. What one? Um, I'm not sure if that has any meaning. I, I think you have a problem with the K. And the was, keyboard, right? Yeah, I don't think there's. I mean, formally, but, but. I don't. I yeah. Because the code will almost depend on infinite domain. Well, I mean, well. Not necessarily. I mean, the way McDonald introduces the McDonald polynomials, he introduced, he of course uses two uh, scalar products on the ring of symmetric functions. In both these cases, he needs to assume a finite number of variables. This is, I guess, corresponds to the the, the second scalar product, right? It, that contains that that's indeed an integral like this, and that contains exactly this this kernel here. Yeah, of course now, you once you have the, your question, the point is the McDonald polynomials themselves 
yes, you can, right, you can define them for arbitrarily many variables. That doesn't mean that any formula that you have for McDonald polynomials necessarily has some whatever universal version that works for infinitely many variables. And so I, I, I think here that the answer would probably be no. Yeah. It would be just this, this infinite product, the evaluation of this integral, does that have like a nice limit? Uh, yeah, and so now I now I regret never. I didn't want to burden you with all these sort of uh, closed form formulas, and now you can ask me questions about it. Uh, we can have a look later, but I, I, I doubt that. And, and even, yeah, I'm not sure we can really give meaning to the left hand side. So then, still, what is the point, right? And, and what does it tell us? So right? we shouldn't just be doing things because we can do them, right? So or maybe we shouldn't be doing things just because we can do them. I don't know. Uh, Anyway, so back to this elliptic A and Salberg integral. So, so we have two of these deltas that we call delta V. So that's essentially for every vertex, you pick up a delta V, and it contains a set of variables, and that set of variables is going to change depending on which vertex I have. So on the first vertex, it's hard to see, right? This would be Z1, so this would be my set of integration variables. And on my second vertex, I have the same delta V, but now on Z, Z2 and so on, up to Zn. So again, I have n sets of integration variables. Then I also have a delta E. And again, those who were at the poster session yesterday would have seen this function before. I think, uh, Farouk, you had it on your poster. So this... This function shows up in all kinds of Reusenaar's, elliptic Reusenaar's business, if you're familiar with that. And that function, this elliptic function, is to going to represent the edges. So that's coupling two neighboring, again, sets of variables. So this is the sort of elliptic analog of what we had earlier in the A.N. Selberg integral. And, and then I sort of use terrible notation because there's no space here. So this this delta V, you can give that an arbitrary number of T parameters. And I just write that as 1 dash M to indicate, well, these are M of these TIs. So when I write here 1 dash 4, this means this depends on T1 up to T4. Here I have T3 up to T6. So all of these deltas have four variables except for the last one. That has 6. Because if I were to have a single vertex, this should be the elliptic Selberg integral, which has six of these TIs. So for all of the other vertices, I only have four TIs. So I have many more TIs than, than before. I have 2n plus 4. And indeed, if n is 1, that gives me 6. And so I put all of these things together in a big product, all of these deltas corresponding to the first vertex, first edge, second vertex, second edge, and so on to give me one big Selberg or A and Selberg type integrand. And of course, well, the point is, if I take that, so that big thing, I'll just call that again, the delta Selberg elliptic, as I said, contains 2n plus 4 parameters and n different sets of variables. Again, I need to assume the ordering of the cardinalities as before. Unsurprising, that condition is still there. And, well, for once, I've given you the evaluation. Here it is. I mean, just a product of gamma functions. Of course, you can't take that in. So, but, uh, Michael, you can maybe see if you can take the K to whatever the limit it is. But, uh, of course, you can't take limits in, in elliptic stuff. So the answer is no. No limits can be taken. Um, and we have to fix this C here that showed up in this uh, edge function. This has to be fixed to pq over t to the power of one half, so in any case. And again, there's balancing conditions as before. So this is the an version of, of the elliptic Salberg integral. And of course, you can stick in two of these. So you can stick in these interpolation functions as well. For the first, and again on the last vertex, the first one contains two variables. The second one contains four variables, because this is the platistically substituted one. 
So in the limit, this would give you your normal jack polynomial, and in the limit, this would give you your statistically shifted jack polynomial. And that's it. All right, so how, sort of in the remaining, I don't know how much time I've got left, but there's, I think, only two or so slides left. So the question is, well, how do you get a result like this? How do you prove it? So in the, a, in the classical AM case, um, the proof that I had used McDonald polynomial theory. So here the proof is quite different, and we're using, again, an invention by Eric, is elliptic interpolation kernel, which is a really powerful gadget. So it's a function, or this kernel, that depends on two sets of variables rather than one. And it generalizes the interpolation functions. So remember, these interpolation functions were defined roughly by having these vanishing at these interpolation points. So now we have two sets of variables. And if I want this interpolation function, it, roughly speaking, so I said this is proportional. Again, there's just some nice product of gamma functions in front of this that I won't trouble you with. It corresponds to this kernel where I specialize the second set of variables. So you can see I do a specialization. The specialization depends on this bipartition. That's why the, where the bipartition shows up. And, and also there is, again, there is a, this thing here depends on the C. And I need to tune that because here this depends on this A and B. So I need to sort of tune the parameters, but that's what you get. So we've bumped up this interpolation function into a function that depends on two sets of variables. And this is a very, as I said, it's a very powerful gadget. So you can, first of all, you can define it recursively, which is really nice. So if you have no, these, both these sets of variables are just empty, and the function is just one. And then if you want it on, say, k plus one variables, well, you just take the thing on k variables, where essentially you integrate out the first set of variables, so that's what we integrate over, and you multiply this with something that looks very much like the elliptic cell density, but it's a little bit simpler. And again, I didn't want to give you the details. It's known as the elliptic Dixon density. For those in the know, this shows up in these type 1 elliptic cell integrals rather than type 2. And again, I referred to the poster so yesterday. But it doesn't matter. It's just something really simple. So if you take that elliptic Dixon density, you integrate this kernel, you get a kernel with one extra variable. Yes? I think before you had several keys, is it correct? If you want to t Here we t don't. T here this function only dep oops, depends on an A and a B and a single T. Yes. Yeah, but is it true before you had several T's? Uh, the, 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 there were the 2N plus 1 plus also a T. So it was 2N plus oh, okay. 2N plus 4 plus a T. Yeah, T I's and, and a T. That, so that's more like this T. Okay, so this one. So I said it's defined recursively, which of course is, is quite nice because it's very explicit. And has some pretty, well, not all of them are remarkable, I should say. So for example, it, it, it's symmetric in P and Q. That's maybe not remarkable. That is just obvious. But it's, it's symmetric in these two sets of variables. Well, the way I define it recursively, i go back here. Right? I'm integrating out this first set of variables against this elliptic Dixon density. And here are the y's. And then I get, the, this is not symmetric at all. So it's magic, at least to me, that uh, you can just swap the x and the y alphabet, nothing happens. Um, as I said, you can swap p and q, not a surprise, and you have another symmetry if you negate x, and you also negate this parameter c, then again, nothing happens. Oh, right. Yes? Have a ah. So in this case, uh, let's see, you will have a cross belt, uh, and very large integral of uh, gamma functions. But you don't need any balancing conditions in this, in this simulation? Or Sorry, in, in which in the evaluation? In the kernel function, recursive relation. Uh, which evaluation? Well, in this recursive uh, formulas. In these recur well, you need to tune the parameters correctly. 
So that's certainly right. You can see your, you need to, but then there's no... Well, it, it is balanced. It, it is balanced because we've tuned the parameters in such a way that, that everything is, yes. So there's no external balance. Usually the, the balancing condition that we write down explicitly involves these TIs, which is sort of this type two kind of business. This is maybe type one or whatever. And so here we've just hidden it in the way we've written this. Yeah, the product of the parameters of the density doesn't depend on the variables. Exactly. That's, yeah. And this is really the key to proving the integral. So you can see if I take this <laughs> kernel function and I have one of these vertex densities and one of these edge densities and I integrate over the set of variables attached to that, I again get a kernel function. And that's really, I mean, that's, this is quite a remarkable, and again, proportional, there's some elliptic gamma functions that I don't trouble you with. So now you can hopefully see what would happen? So let's go back to this was our picture, roughly. So this is sort of a sketch how you would prove this. If I hit this on the left with a kernel function, of course I can't quite because I, I, I'm already integrating over these ZIs. But if I write down something that is very similar to the Selberg integral that we have here, but with that kernel function inserted, then I can just integrate over Z1, because there's one vertex and one edge set of variables, so I take a kernel function also with the Z1 alphabet, I just integrate that out, I get another kernel function that now sits here, and it's going to do the same with this second pair, one edge, one vertex, and you just move this thing, so you just push it through, and, and that's essentially what you do. But of course now I have a kernel function in the integrand as well that wasn't originally there, well the kernel function is in the case where you have these interpolation functions, because now you just specialize that kernel and it just gives you these interpolation functions, so you get, automatically you get this AFLT version. So this kernel function is really it's very powerful, it can just essentially recursively just integrate out all of the vertices and edges of the diagram until there's nothing left. Or till you're left, I should say, with the, just the SL2 case, which we already know. So that's that's really the magic uh, of this kernel. And without the kernel function, right, you wouldn't be able to do this. This recursive technique. You really need the fact that this kernel function depends on, on two sets of variables. So it's, as I said, it's a very powerful gadget. All right. So let me just stop. So of course, there's always questions. So well, I told you that. In the non-elliptic case, of course, this had to do with SU2 AGT. Now we have an elliptic integral. Well, is there some, right? Does this connect in some way? And I, I tried to read some of these elliptic AGT, and I didn't understand the word of it, so I have no idea what the answer is. But it sort of seems plausible that there's some connection. So if I take the um, elliptic Selberg integral, which has six parameters, if you add two more parameters, and this is work of Ares and, and Slava, they've both written about this extensively, you no longer get an evaluation, but you get a really nice transformation. And why is that nice? Because this transformation, well, it has this sort of hidden E7 symmetry, which is quite sort of surprising that that shows up. So what happens if instead of 2n plus 4, I take 2n plus 6 variables? Is there, do or can I bump this up to some transformation, and if so, what sort of hidden symmetries would this have? I have no idea if this is possible or not, but given that at the very end, after we've pushed this through, we were left with just the elliptic Selberg integral, you can imagine, well, if we just did a little bit more and we pushed it through, but we had two extra variables at the end, then we could apply transformation, and then maybe we can push it back to reverse everything we did, and maybe we get something that has some nice they get some nice integral transformation with them, something that possibly could generalize E7 simply. I have no idea. I also told you that the, uh, in the classical case, everything had to do with these KZ equations. Well, now we're elliptic. So again, do these integrals sort of show up in, in sort of elliptic versions of that kind of story. 
And finally, can we add interpolation functions to every vertex of the Dinkin diagram? Because this is really what you would want. So the problem, why, so that at the moment we have two, if I just go back to SL2, we have two jack polynomials, and this is enough to deal with AGT for SU2. But if you want to do AC, uh, AGT, for example, for SU3, you would need the Selberg integral on two variables, but you would need, rather than two, you need a jack polynomial on every vertex. And at the moment, we only have a jet polynomial at the extremal vertices, so we're missing one in the middle. But we don't know how to put it in. And of course, that means also in the elliptic case, we don't really know how to put this in. So that is still a problem, and that's still why some of this story, unfortunately, is not related to AGT if we move beyond the case of SL2, which is, is still a little bit disappointing, but who knows? That's, uh, again something for, for later. So, thank you very much. It's not really doing super stuff. Um, I, I'm not sure if you that directly. Have you, have you any, got any thoughts on this? Slava, is that yes, feasible? Yes, it goes towards super symmetry. Sorry? It goes towards super symmetry. Okay, so to, towards super symmetry. Yeah, but that, that's not exactly the question. Yeah, exactly, that's but super symmetry is in the game more of right? Yes. Well, I have to be careful. 
This is certainly enough to deal with AGT. That doesn't, of course, mean that necessarily in that story there's also more general integrals that show up. But what you need is you need to be able to evaluate exactly this particular case. So I have to be really careful. I do not recall that they have considerable sort of more general integrals, still with two jacks in there. But yeah. so no, I, I don't want to totally rely on my memory. So maybe you are very good. There is these functions called uh, generalized jet polynomials, I guess. Uh, that is not something. Uh, generalized jet polynomials. I mean, it's like they like a jet polynomials, but again, they labeled like and, uh, several partitions, not just one. Okay. I'm not sure if I'm familiar with that. Okay, so wait. Well, one naive question is for try to consider putting in so the population polynomials, the, the, the analog object would be maybe some Paul Macomo polynomials which might be Schreitz's um, non stationary but, but the point is we need to be BCN. So you need to put in some BCN, if, right? If you uh, put functions in there that break the, the, the hyper-ultrahedral symmetry, then nothing nice is, is going to come out of that. So, so if you were to construct the DCM version of that. So in the, of course, in the classical story, you could imagine, but I believe, right, we sort of understand why you can jack and you need nothing else to do. So in any case, but in, in certainly in this story, that, that's not going to lead to anything good. All right, if uh, there are no more questions, so we have that one. Okay, so let's stop here and